The main topic of this lecture is Fisher matrices, but we will start by defining the likelihood function. The likelihood function is the basis of a lot of modern statistics and science, and it's defined as follows. Script L, likelihood, is the probability of getting a certain piece of data given an underlying theory. So we're asking, having made a measurement, how likely is it that we got that measurement given that the universe is described by a certain theory? So we'll talk about specific pieces of data that we can gather and specific theories in the realm of cosmology in a little bit. But let's just schematically imagine what a likelihood function might look like. So we'll plot likelihood as a function of some parameter lambda. And what we would like is our likelihood function to have a very sharp peak in it. Meaning, at some value lambda zero, a true underlying value of our parameter lambda, we are very likely to get our data. I, our data is inconsistent with lambda being this value or this value but it's extremely likely we would have our data if lambda were the value lambda naught. And we can imagine, however, another likelihood function where this distribution is very broad, that there is a peak at some lambda zero, but there's also a good deal of likelihood at some distance away from lambda zero, saying that while we are most likely to recover data with the value lambda zero, there is a good deal of likelihood we, we will acquire data with another value, even if lambda zero is the true value. So what we're looking here, for here is some way to quantify the difference between these two likelihood functions and ask, given a set of measurements, given some data, how constraining are we on the underlying theory? And the clear sign we're looking for is the width of this likelihood function, or some measure of how, fall, how fast it falls off from the maximum. If it falls off very quickly, then our data is relatively constraining. However, if it falls off very slowly, then our data doesn't do much to constrain the underlying theory. So to come up with a more quantitative framework for this, we will tailor expand the likelihood function around its peak. So. If we take our likelihood function, L of lambda, and Taylor expand around the peak value lambda zero, this becomes L of lambda zero, plus a first derivative, plus a second derivative. Now, we've defined lambda zero is the location of our maximum, so this first derivative is zero. Therefore, first piece of information is here in this second derivative, the second derivative of the likelihood function with respect to our parameter. Now if we only expand out to second order, we're approximating our likelihood function as a parabola. And that's generally not a good approximation. Our likelihood function can have any shape. A better approximation is to look at the second derivative of the log of the likelihood function. Instead of approximating it as a parabola now, we're approximating our likelihood function as a Gaussian, which is a much better approximation to a general peak shape. And we can generalize this expression. If we want to work in multi-parameter space, and this I'll define as minus f, where f is the Fisher or curvature matrix. The Fisher matrix is sometimes called the curvature matrix because it is the second derivative of the likelihood function. It tells how curved the likelihood function is around its maximum. So the bigger the values in the Fisher matrix, the more curved it is, meaning the more peaky it is, meaning the more constraining your data is for that particular parameter. Now it's worth having a brief aside to talk about 
another expression in statistics, the covariance matrix, which is related to the Fisher matrix as follows. So we're working this general two-parameter alpha beta space. And so the covariance matrix is the inverse of the Fisher matrix. And let's write it out explicitly. So in the diagonals, we have sigma alpha squared and sigma beta squared. And on the off diagonals, sigma beta alpha and sigma alpha beta. These diagonal terms are the variances. And alpha and beta are two parameters, or lambda alpha and lambda beta. And they have the conventional statistical definition of the variance. They tell the spread around a true value that we constrain the parameter to be. And these diagonal terms are the covariances, how much alpha and beta covary with respect to each other. So we'll often see this plotted. So this is a contour plot representing the one and two sigma constraints on lambda alpha and lambda beta. So the width in the alpha direction is related to sigma alpha squared and the height here in the beta direction is related to sigma beta squared. And so the way I've drawn it, and most importantly in this case, and in this case there's zero covariance, meaning I can take a step in alpha and not have to change beta at all. And this explanation will make more sense if we look at a case where there is covariance. More generically, if there is covariance, a step in alpha means that I have to change beta as well to be consistent with my data. So alpha and beta, or lambda alpha and lambda beta, covary. And one more point on this aside is how we calculate these contours. One and two sigma are defined by the chi-squared distribution, and we can calculate chi-squared directly from the Fisher matrix. So F here is our Fisher matrix, and delta is some step away from our fiducial lambda alpha lambda beta, where we've centered these contours. We can simply do a brute force computation with our Fisher matrix and taking steps away in this coordinate space to see what the value of chi-squared is. And depending on our number of parameters, there are well-defined delta chi-squareds corresponding to 1 sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma, etc. You can find those in numerical recipes spelled out exactly what the delta chi-squared value is. And you can see that we're getting a sense of why the Fisher matrix is, again, the curvature matrix. That the bigger the Fisher matrix, the smaller the covariance and matrix, and therefore the variances, so the smaller these contours get, the more peaky or more curved this representation of the likelihood function as a contour plot, the, the more narrow it is. The last thing we would like to know about Fisher matrices is how to calculate them. We've seen once they're known, a tremendous amount can be done. We can get the covariance matrix and in turn know how well we've constrained the parameters we're interested in. In the last part of this video, I'll show an example from cosmology calculating the Fisher matrix. So we need to do this example to have both theory and the data. And the Fisher matrix, which is related to the likelihood function, explains how to relate the probability of getting our data to our underlying theory. So in this case, our theory will be the lambda CDM model of the universe, which is described by a number of parameters we'll call lambda alpha. And these can be any of the parameters of cosmology, the omega matter, omega baryon, omega lambda, really anything our observable it might depend on. So our observable, the data in this case we'll use, is the power spectrum, P of K, in particular the matter power spectrum. And we'll be measuring P of K as a function of K, Fourier mode of the cosmological volume of the universe. Now, a lot of what I'm going to do follows Scott Dodelson's Modern Cosmology book, where he works out the same example for the CMB and its observable power spectrum, C sub L. Now, what we'd like to know here is some chi-squared. In particular, this is the chi-squared relating 
our observed data to our underlying theory lambda sub alpha. And so this chi squared is expressed as follows. We have the theoretical power spectrum, P of k, for our set of lambda sub alpha, our true values. And we're looking at the residuals, the difference between that and our observed power spectrum, P observed of k. And we're dividing out by our uncertainty, the delta P of k, the errors in our measured power spectrum. And we've summed over all the k's we've measured. And we can do the same trick we did earlier and Taylor expand this chi-squared around its minimum, which we'll call lambda sub-zero. We'll work in one-dimensional space just for ease of illustration and algebra, but this generalizes quite easy to many, many parameters, as we'll do at the end. Taylor expanding chi-squared out to second order gives us the following relationship. And as before, since we're expanding it around its minimum, in this case, lambda zero, the first derivative is zero. And if you'll grant the following assumption that the likelihood function is a Gaussian and chi-squared, which is the same as saying our errors on the measured parameters are Gaussian. And this is an assumption we made earlier. It's representing the peak of the likelihood as a Gaussian. Now, again, granting this assumption the following statement is true. We can then calculate the second derivative explicitly to get a formula for our Fisher matrix. So this is the explicit differentiation of the chi-squared we defined earlier relating the observed p of k to the theoretical p of k. Where I've dropped the semicolon lambda sub a in the theoretical p of k. Now this second term, the difference between the observed power spectrum and the theoretical power spectrum, we've already assumed our errors are Gaussian. Therefore, this is equally likely to be greater as it is less than theoretical value. And this term averages to zero. And we're left with our final expression for the Fisher matrix, which I'll generalize to multiple parameters. The remarkable thing about this formula is that all dependence on the observed power spectrum dropped out when we made this cancellation above. So to calculate our Fisher matrix, all we need to know is how the theoretical power spectrum depends on all of our underlying parameters. And these derivatives can be, in the case of the power spectrum, calculated numerically from a program like CAM, which calculates the power spectrum. And we need to know our uncertainties on the power spectrum, our noise which can come from, in the case of cosmology, either noise in our system, shot noise, or thermal noise in a radio experiment, and sample variance, cosmic variance, from the universe itself. But knowing these two things, we can calculate our Fisher matrix, and therefore determine before our experiment is ever conducted how well we will constrain all of our cosmological parameters of interest.